All right, I think we're going to get things started here today. Welcome to the last day of our conference here. I hope everybody's been having a really good time, learning lots of great things, meeting and networking with folks. One very important statement I just want to make is it's going to be really important when the event is done, we're going to send you a link to evaluate the conference. We really want to know what your thoughts and ideas are about the event. We're also going to send you a little membership engagement survey so that if you want to become more involved, we'd love to have lots of you get involved. We're going to be up in Milwaukee next year. We have lots of committees and groups, so we're hoping that you can get engaged and stay connected. We've had just a delightful time with you here in uh, Jacksonville, and we'd love to have you continue on with the board. Uh, and with the organization in general. So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Alexandra Nowakowski. And she goes by Zan, and let me give you her background here. She's uh, a medical sociology professor at Florida State University. I knew the first time I started chatting with Zan, I liked her because she got her uh, master's in public health from uh, the State University of New Jersey. <laughs> Does anybody know what the name of the State University of New Jersey is? Rutgers. Rutgers. There you go. So uh, she did that. She got uh, her PhD in medical sociology from Florida State University. And today she's going to be talking on QA, QI in clinical practice. So help me welcome Zan. All right. So. All right, well thank you Stuart for the warm welcome. I hope everybody's been having a fantastic time at the conference so far. I'm really glad to be here with you this morning. In this workshop, we're gonna be focusing on opportunities for quality improvement in asthma care for a diverse group of healthcare professionals. So before we get started, let me just, um, there we go. I have to tell you before I get started with this that there are no conflicts of interest that I have to disclose, either financial or otherwise. So with that out of the way, let me just get to know y'all a little bit. How many people here in the room today are nurses? Or lots of nurses. What about certified asthma educators? Okay, registered respiratory therapists. Physicians. Uh, how many general practice physicians? And any pulmonologists? Immunologists? Okay. So it looks like we've got mostly nurses, asthma educators, and respiratory therapists, which is fantastic, because that's really the demographic I geared this workshop for. One of the great things about working with nurses, I've learned as evaluator for the Florida Asthma Program, is that you get to work with people who are really on the front lines of care, who know what's going on every single day, who are plugged in with patients in a way that sometimes other health providers don't get to be. So there's some really unique opportunities there for patient engagement and patient empowerment in promoting quality asthma care that we're gonna dig into a little bit today. So one of the things that I do at Florida State is something called CBPR, Community-Based Participatory Research. And I really like this approach to research and evaluation because it's something that's really led by the communities that are being served, so in this case, people with asthma. The goal of CDPR is to have a process where the evaluators and the patients are kind of equally empowered. They have an equitable voice in the process and really get to steer it together. And we love this because we find that what we learn is a lot better from this approach. So I thought I would take kind of a CBPR approach to this plenary and really have y'all generate some content and share with me as I'm sharing with you. So we're gonna do a few activities and that's mostly what's on my slides for today. And we're gonna learn a little bit about each other. We're gonna do some sharing about projects we've worked on and successes we've experienced as well as challenges we've faced and we're going to start to synthesize that information to give you all some ideas about how to approach QI in your own workplaces. So I'll tell you a little bit more about me. As Stuart said, I'm a medical sociologist. And for those who are not familiar with the discipline, 
That's a way of describing someone who studies the social causes and consequences of health. So I mostly look at chronic disease management, and I have a very strong focus on medically underserved populations. So these are going to be populations that experience multiple forms of intersectional disadvantage. We work a lot uh, at FSU, for example, with black and Latin families. We work a lot with indigenous families who are living in rural communities. I work a lot with older adults. One of my appointments is actually in the Department of Geriatrics. And working with some minority groups that we're really just starting to learn more about. One of the key, uh, I think, exciting opportunities right now in asthma QI is, you know, we're getting all these data about people in same-sex relationships, people who experience gender transition, or people who are non-binary in some respect with regard to their gender and sexuality. We're starting to learn more about the tremendous diversity of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender populations. Uh, we're starting to learn about the diversity of intersex people in our communities. But we don't know a lot about what their asthma management outcomes look like. So I've actually been talking a little bit with Ginger Chu up at CDC, who's uh, one of their science officers and also the head of their LGBT caucus, about some opportunities for research that we can do to learn more about what does it mean to provide quality asthma care for our tremendously diverse population here in the United States. So that's, that's probably, I think, you know, the most unmet need that we have right now in terms of data is just breaking out this population and really understanding what factors related to stressors, to any abuse that people experience, to medication access, to sense of comfort in talking openly with a provider, um, to health behaviors, for example, all those smoking is declining in the population overall, it's on the rise in LGBT and otherwise queer identified people. So that's a big challenge to effective asthma management. Really, I come at all of my work from a perspective of advocacy for the community. And I think that my interest in sex and gender minorities really speaks to that. Um, I started doing that kind of advocacy work in high school, but then my spouse is also bisexual and gender queer, and so I've been able to learn a lot about unique needs that might not be apparent on the surface based on somebody's experiences of other people responding to their identity. And it's something I've always been interested in as someone who's openly agender. So that kind of was a meeting of the minds for my, me and my partner and saying, you know, how, how can we think a little bit differently about how some of these facets of our identities that may be beneath the surface impact our outcomes? And I also have reactive airways disease. I have a, an unspecified mucous membrane disease that I'm still trying to get diagnosed and going through the ringer trying to get good care for, and occasionally taking medications that make me a little bit narcoleptic. So that's been a 32-year journey for me, and I don't expect it to wrap up anytime soon. Thank you, Stuart. But I was diagnosed very early in life with um, some type of pulmonary condition, maybe asthma, maybe not, but it certainly has a lot of similar features. And over time, it became clear that this affected my whole body. So I've had a number of close calls, had to deal with a lot of pain, um, loss of function in my lungs, although some of these medications have helped me out with that. So I've become a lot more passionate over the years about making sure that people can get good access to care. And that's what made the difference for me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. So trying to make sure that we can spread that around to the entire community, that's really at the heart of what asthma quality means to me. So when we're doing assessment of asthma quality, we might want to look at things like the reach of our programs and not just measures of effectiveness or utility. But we want to look at those things, too, because we want to make sure that we really understand the nuances of benefits to people. So this webinar, or this uh, workshop, if you're here physically at the conference, is really about making the rubber meet the road, making what we learn directly feed into behavior change for us as professionals. 
So the first thing that I would like y'all to do at your tables, and now you see why I gave you note cards, is think of something that you have done to promote asthma quality improvement in your community. Think of what something you've done to improve the quality of care. It can be about something you've done to improve access of care. But I want you to think of one real good thing that you've done for asthma QI. Write it down, just take a minute, and then everybody's going to pass their note card around the table. So everybody should be reading everybody else's note card. And as you're reading other people's note cards, kind of think about what are the common themes that I'm seeing here in people's responses. So if anybody's having trouble getting started this morning, some of the success stories that I've heard in the past when I've done uh, presentations at conferences would be things like making sure that school children can get spacers to use their inhaled medication. That's something we still struggle with in Florida. Uh, children having peer mentors who are a little older who've been through asthma management courses before and kind of know the ropes. And use of asthma action plans in schools. This is something we've done a little better with in Florida, but we want to see those numbers for asthma action plans getting close to 100% in the schools that we're working with. So slowly but surely, but we have seen that there's a lot of confidence that comes for teachers and for families and for the students themselves when folks know that they have a plan in place, when there's not so much ambiguity with their care. All right. So, if you have written something on your note card that you have done to promote asthma QI, pass it to the next person on your right, and just keep passing your cards around until everybody's gotten a chance to read everybody's card. everybody's note cards, you can take the piece of cardstock or paper that's on your table and start writing down what you see as shared themes. So what are some commonalities that showed up between different people's responses? And get down a few notes because that's going to be what we use for our next activity.
All right, I'm going to bring us back to some group discussion. It sounds like you're really engaged at your tables, which is exactly what we want, so keep it up. And one of the things that I always find is incredibly helpful about getting to work with people who are on the front lines of healthcare is that y'all have an incredibly great source of knowledge continuously about what your patients are experiencing on a daily basis. And that really sets health providers who are intimately involved in patient engagement apart. I think there's probably no better way to understand the service needs of patients than to talk to healthcare providers. And this is one of those cases where if you think about a community engaged approach, you can really get a great balance of information between service needs, which is your perceptions as people who are not the patient but are working closely with them of what is necessary to improve their care, and then their perceptions of the same thing, which would be called service demands. So I always get kind of overlapping sets of information when I talk to patients versus when I talk to their providers. And putting that information together is just this incredibly powerful tool for understanding what's missing. So I'm excited to hear what all of you came up with at your table. So let's start off on this side of the room. Uh, take a minute at your tables. Pick somebody who's going to stand up and speak for you. And then we're going to make sure that we get a mic to you so that people can hear your answers. So let's go with this table right here in the upper left. The speaker stand up and you will get a microphone. And thanks for being our first volunteer. <laughs> um, we have three nurses at our table and a community health worker. So we're all involved in writing asthma action plans or, and uh, we provide asthma education, whether it's in our physician's office or at the home visit. Excellent. All right, so let's go around over here. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll talk, but um, yep. apparently I'm really bad at listening to instructions. I, we are or aren't supposed to be like detailing a project. Oh, that comes, you, did you jump ahead in the slides? No, I don't think so. All right, so we actually are going to be thinking about what a project might look like. That's the next activity, so I like that you're thinking in that direction. But right now we're sharing common themes in things that people at our table have done to promote asthma quality improvement? Phew, okay. Okay. Um, so we have, out of the six of us, five school nurses, one is also a community health worker, and then a pediatrician. All right. Um, and so we're all working with kids. Um, so a lot of it was about education mm -hmm. for those patients who, and it, which is also empowerment, right? And then addressing their barriers. So to payment, Excellent. reimbursement, to access, um, to information, to specialists in the pharmacy. Great. So we have asthma action plans over here, removing barriers and focus on patient empowerment over here. I like where I really like where this is going. All right, I'm being blinded, so I can't even see if there's a table right back there, but maybe there is. Folks next to the people who just spoke. Somebody stand up. Now, I mean, I, I am I am literally without eyesight when I stand right here, so I I got to take this I understand because I was there yesterday. <laughs> okay. So that all is right, a bright lights. <laughs> We're all from North Carolina and really involved with the Asthma Alliance of North Carolina. We developed two curriculums, one for childcare providers and one for elementary and middle schools. It's kind of a train to train. Um, train the trainer manuals so everybody has a better understanding about asthma, what's expected in those facilities. Excellent, so train the trainer. Were we not talking about this just yesterday for Florida doing a train the trainer curriculum? So it seems to be a meeting of the minds with certain things, so we got a train the trainer opportunity. I really like that. And we had a lot of success with that uh, up in New Jersey when I was working in occupational safety and health. It's so a little bit different focus, but same idea. We had a lot of success. All right, let's go far left in the back, and then we'll go right next to y'all. Yes. Good morning. Um, we're both nurses in offices. She's from Missouri. I'm from Tallahassee. Goal knows. And we are big into spacer education and provision. We put spacers on everybody. 
uh, peak flow, peak flow information. We do provide free peak flows in our office and education in the diaries, or we use graph paper, and asthma action plans, a ready, set, go approach. Um, we also provide those. We educate the patient and the parent, and hopefully we're going to be implementing the school nurses to involve them, make them comfortable with calling the offices and working with the providers. Excellent. So a bit of a case management approach there, direct engagement of providers and practices. All right, next table. Hello. We have two community health workers, two nurse and a health educator. So <clears throat> our focus and what we do all together is um, we advocate for the children that have asthma. We all focus on um, trying to get better outcomes and tailor our materials so that uh, children with asthma will be able to identify and understand education that's provided. We also assess the needs of the children and try to engage them and also um, provide uh, resources with navigation. And we all go out to the community. Excellent, so I realize I should have asked, show of hands in the room, who is the community health worker? Hands up high. Okay, we got some, great. So community health worker engagement is actually kind of our newest initiative with the Florida Asthma Program. And we've been working a lot with Glenn Flores from um, up north, at, I think he's at Rochester. He's at Mayo, uh, the Rochester branch of Mayo Clinic. And he and his team developed a community health worker training that had some really creative elements that, were, that looked like they'd be a fit for Florida. So we've been working with him a little bit to get some strategies in place. And this has been kind of a missing piece of the puzzle for a lot of asthma management programs because what you lose when you don't have CHWs engaged is you lose that vital link between really understanding and knowing and having personal relationships with community members and understanding asthma care on a really functional level. So when somebody can bridge that gap, you just open up all kinds of opportunities for what you can do with patient engagement and empowerment. All right. So let's come around then in the far back in this row. Um, hello. We are from Georgia. Um, we work with the Department of Public Health. Um, our program um, targets the underserved community. Um, we're all pediatric based. We help um, coordinate care for children that have asthma um, and we work with asthma action plans. We go into the home so we are out in the community. Um, and we also work with gap filling. So we do pay for medication, spacers, all of that kind of stuff that they might need. Doctor's visits if they need to go to the pulmonologist, transportation, all of that. And what do you hear from your patients? This is, this is really right at the crux of what I was hoping to accomplish today with y'all. What do you hear from your patients and their families about the impact of this program? Um, a lot of them are like, this is a lifesaver. Uh -huh. um, and that they have a resource to go to outside of a healthcare professional to talk one on one with on their level. Awesome. So, when you're hearing things like, this is a lifesaver, that is a really key indicator that your program's not only effective for the people you're serving, but that it's also useful. And we were just talking yesterday after the sessions wrapped up about the fact that we need to do more work on really tailoring our interventions, not just to meet the basic needs of families that are struggling economically or struggling with intersectional marginalization, but really to affirm the whole family. So we're starting to think, you know, as an asthma management program, We've got to think beyond just asthma management. We've got to think about the complex constellation of people's lives and really tap into patient utility on a broader level, making our services a game changer. So not just a reduction in asthma symptoms like wheezing or coughing, but really a total reduction in the life stresses that are associated with disadvantage. So this may mean things like partnering with food banks, for example, 
to improve community food access, doing a medication or spacer program with some of the community organizations that provide other household goods. We have to look at what's allowable within current policy regulations and then think about what's possible. But this is a line of questioning that really thinking in a broader way about patient utility has brought us to. We don't just want to be meeting the basics and missing opportunities to connect. That's actually one of the 10 essential public health services is linkages. And we think that we can be doing more of that. So it's, it's wonderful to hear about a program that's had success with that type of intervention. And I'd love to follow up with you and get some more details about how you made it work. All right, next table. Good. You're thinking as a team, I like that. Go ahead. Um, I think most of uh, what we do is um, working more in the schools and with daycare providers, uh, kind of thinking outside the office, not necessarily in the home, but it's in the community. And like you say, kind of forming those liaisons and uh, that bridge closing the gap. Excellent. So we had a lot of success with an asthma-friendly child care training in Florida. And I know a lot of other states got interested in what we were doing and a couple of other programs we're doing. And so we're seeing more engagement with daycare providers. That's a prime audience. You got a lot of hand-to-mouth contact in daycare centers with environmental toxicants and other triggers that, while they're not necessarily inhaled, guess what? Anything that gives you any kind of allergic reaction, that can be an asthma trigger. So when we started thinking differently about the needs of a young population based on their behavior and their environment, we were able to get pretty far pretty quickly. So it sounds like some other states and other programs are experiencing similar success, and that's fantastic. Any time that we can bring in a population that hasn't been fully accommodated before, that's incredible. The, the power of inclusion and affirmation is transformational in every area of healthcare that I've seen so far. All right, did everybody combine? Okay, so y'all combined. And okay, let's go to our folks in the front right here. So we are two respiratory therapists, one in a clinic and one in a hospital setting and a pediatric pulmonologist. And our theme is uh, working with uh, healthcare providers, one through uh, the clinic setting, one through the hospital setting, and one through a, um, a clinic, a primary care clinic to improve their overall care of kids with asthma. Fantastic. So linkages with primary care, and that's always been a key emphasis. And it's really one of those core components of the EPR3 guidelines, the Expert Parental Report 3 guidelines, that are so crucial to assuring asthma QI in clinical settings. So we use the EPR3 framework a lot here in Florida, and it's one of the ways that we assess what our hospitals are doing to achieve high quality asthma care. Um, one of the things that we find is sometimes missed is that most important element of the EPR3, which is assisting patients in transitioning to effective self-management. That's really the goal. It's not to keep them coming back to the hospital, getting really good care at the hospital. It's to make sure that when a person who's been hospitalized goes on their way, that they're not gonna come back, that they're gonna have a regular source of care in the community, and that if you see them at the hospital again, it's not gonna be something asthma related. It'll be, you know, oh, you know, tragic sailing accident and they needed stitches. And you don't wanna see them in the ER again for asthma. That's not the goal. All right, let's go back here to our middle table. Hi. Um, so we all three work for Nemours. Um, two of us are located here in Jacksonville, and then Mariella is down in Orlando. Um, we work in research, so two of us are uh, clinical uh, research coordinators, and I'm a uh, research nurse. Um, we have several studies that we're doing specifically for asthma. Um, one is specifically looking at the African American population. Mm -hmm. um, we have one for our 5 to 11 year olds and then one for our 12 to 17 year olds. Um, we provide all of their asthma medication for free. 
Um, so if you are a pediatrician in the area, <laughs> um, it is a, uh, an option for you guys to um, maybe look at the possibility of your kids being in a research project because we do provide that for them. They don't have to go to their pharmacist and get and pay for their medications. Um, so that includes um, everything for their controller, their rescue, their spacers. Um, we provide asthma action plans. We do all their procedures, their spirometry. We're typically seeing these kids from anywhere from 11 months to 16 months, so on a monthly basis. So we see them quite often, including phone calls in between for their visits. Um, so we're in very, very um, tight communication with our, our kids, including their families. When they do come in, um, their visits are usually um, anywhere from like four hours or longer, depending on how many kids we have coming in that day, um, to like an hour. So we do get a really um, uh, um, a, a, a long time to, to uh, have a communication with these kids and their families. So we encourage the, you know, their, their caregivers, their parents, their grandparents, whoever, who is taking care of them or see, sees them or takes care of them on a day-to-day -day basis, which could include grandparents as well. Um, so with that said, if we have to give grandparents, sometimes their parents are divorced. So if that means we're giving mom, dad, grandma, and the school, rescue medication, we're giving all four different areas rescue medications and spacers. Um, because we know, we understand that just giving one out or possibly two just for the household and just for the school is maybe not enough. Um, so we are doing that and we are able to provide that. Um, along with procedures, so we're doing spirometry every single time they come in. So we have a really big picture of how their asthma is doing on a, um, uh, you know, seasonally or yearly basis, um, which we could provide to the pediatrician if they want us to. Okay. And Fantastic. Then so. So, so getting boots on the ground and just providing the services. Yep. Excellent. And do you tailor your approach or your materials at all for different cultural groups? I know you mentioned um, African American, which may include Haitian American and probably Latino children it as well in it Orlando. Anyone who identifies themselves as an African American. Okay. Excellent. And so oh, do you different provide languages? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Yep. Absolutely. That's a big one. Yep. So materials and we do that have, accommodate. We have translators and all that if if we need those. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, that's huge if you're working with a diverse population and having those resources on hand, just knowing your demographic is never a bad idea. But especially in some of our really diverse urban areas in Florida, being mindful that different messaging may, di may be differently salient to different cultural groups, that not everything is heard the same way depending on how someone grew up, and that it might be more effective or less effective to present concepts in one way or another, as well as simply making sure that materials are available in people's spoken languages and also in alternate modes like visuals if people don't have hearing um, or if there are limitations on literacy, making sure that people can access materials in a way that really works for them. All right, in the back. Uh, we had many diverse things that we did. Uh, one person in particular um, paired at a university level paired uh, respiratory therapists with individual student in middle school and followed them through a year. And um, another person works for creating material for pediatricians' offices, uh, asthma action plans and those kinds of things in multilingual type um, proje projects for them. And then another one is a nurse practitioner who worked with groups of families. And all of us were working with underserved populations. Uh, one of us was a, a school nurse who ran a year-long program for elementary and teenagers in the high school and also worked at the same time as a community health nurse and worked with the families. Excellent. All right, let's go over here. I want to make sure that we get everybody, and then when we wrap up, I'm going to leave you with some homework, which I think is going to be probably pretty easy based on all the rich discussion that we're having today. So let's keep it going. All right, well, they paid me to speak here, so. <laughs> hey, I'm from, I'm from Jersey. Sometimes I understand that's what it takes. 
<laughs> may maybe they knew a person who knew a person, right? <laughs> so our overall um, consensus was basically self-management training um, using device care techniques and information about device care and also identifying and helping to control the asthma triggers in the household or wherever. So, yeah. Excellent. And I, I got to, I suppose, in the interest of disclosure, I should let you all know they are paying me to speak, too. <laughs> Hope that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, in the middle. Do I have to stand up? No. no. Hi. Um, I'm sitting here amongst seasoned board members, um, founding member who, because of the founding members, we are here today. And uh, the common theme here with us is probably education educating ourselves through conferences like this, sharing with you guys, um, and of course, down to the patient level, engaging that patient, whether it be with a specific asthma action plan, and in any way, getting their, mm -hmm. telling their stories, as Dr. Metz has said, um, and really getting down to getting the patients involved in their education, self-management. So that was one of the other really important points that I was hoping was going to come out in the discussion here is that you know, as many things as we do in the states that are funded by the National Asthma Program to understand the needs of our populations, whether it's you know, looking at care pathways, you know, looking at hospital discharge data, one of the most important things is just talking to patients. That is, you know, that is the key to really understanding what's missing. So every time I hear that come out, I'm like, yeah, I just want to pump my fist. Patient engagement, all right, up in the front. Okay, we're here from Golisano Children's in Fort Myers, and so it's really great to have all of our team here. And I think what we work on is unity. We're trying to link our emergency departments approach with our inpatient approach. We have a discharge nurse and we have Teresa who does the outpatient management program. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly trying to be sure that the patients that we see, and we see a lot of the same patients come through, feel like wherever they enter our programs that they're getting the same message so that they feel like we're really supporting them. So I think a lot of ours has to do with making awareness not only of what we do as a children's hospital in our area, but that there's a lot of support that goes beyond an inpatient admission or a visit to the emergency room. Excellent. So the total ecology of care in the community. And that's really the focus that we want to encourage everybody to get, to get into and to stick with. And again, it goes back to some of those 10 essential public health service, linkages, assurance of access. You need a wide net with tiny little holes to be able to keep that going. So how many of us here in the room, and I should have maybe asked this at the beginning, how many of us are patients with asthma or a similar disease? And it's okay if you don't want to disclose, but I think that we bring kind of a special awareness to what's involved day to day in managing our asthma? What are all the little things that could possibly go wrong? And how do we deal with them? How do we manage them when we encounter those challenges? It's a constant process. All right, up here in the front. Um, so we have, um, well actually we have some additions since we started, but. That's um, always good. <laughs> <laughs> um, respiratory therapist who's in the hospital, an emergency room, and then um, I'm a nurse practitioner and I work in a clinic. Now we do a specialty clinic that is um, high risk asthma. So we do have a medical component and a community health worker. So we have community health worker and we have um, our asthma educator who's certified asthma educator who's also a respiratory therapist. And then we have other team members as well. Um, so common themes between the two of us as we were talking about is um, that he was saying that you know he doesn't have that community piece and so he's seeing how that piece is something that is missing and so you know when you start to look at the differences between the effectiveness of the program just having something that goes into the community um, becomes really important um, we um, as a as a team we're looking at fields of medication is one of our things that we try to look at as far as adherence with controller medications. Um, and we actually look at their 
their data to see how often they go and refill their medicines. And then we've employed some different programs to try and see if we can improve that number, including home pharmacies to deliver medicines to them, um, community health workers driving all over the city, going to pick up medicines and take it to the house and those kind of things, but in an effort to improve their adherence. Awesome. So a really nice example of how a lot of National Asthma Program grantees are realizing the value of triangulating data sources. Provider engagement, community engagement, patient engagement, and putting that all together and zeroing in when you have people who fall into multiple groups within that schema because they can understand some of those gaps in care in ways that are just really special and unique. All right. Right back here. All right, I'm, I'm getting some shaking heads, so I'm assuming y'all know something. I don't. Let's go to the table back there. Uh, we also um, found our common theme was education. We're uh, both hospital-based, and um, you joined us later. So, uh, But we're both hospital-based, and uh, your hospital is more pediatric, and I deal mostly with adults. But our education is many different vehicles, so we don't just try to look at it from one approach. We had things like uh, smoking cessation to standardized action plans, community outreach, so we're not just staying within the four walls, but trying to reach out to the community. Uh, day camps for kids to try to educate them. So we had lots of different vehicles, but trying to get education uh, in whatever format the patients best learn. So that was our common theme. All right, excellent. In the back. Um, so we also have education in common. We're located all across the nation from the Northeast, Midwest, Southwest, RNs, RTs, health educator, um, hospital-based, health center-based, and we all serve an underserved population. Um, so we all work with patients on their education, um, whether it's family support group meetings, state asthma camp, creating um, a video um, in the Navajo language, providing Spanish English education, um, and then we all seem to experience trans, um, transportation difficulties with our patients. Ah, oh, so transitions physically as well as functionally with different types of care. We have found at FSU that that is so important in fact, that we actually started a transition center at Tallahassee Memorial Health Center. It's one of the first of its kind, but the goal is to support patients who are moving between different types of care in those really vulnerable times. All right. It is 9 o'clock, and I want to make sure that we're respectful of all the other speakers' time. But Stuart is telling me I can have five more minutes. This is great. So we can get around to the rest of the tables instead of having to have anybody just jump on with anything new. So one minute each per table, Max. Share your most important common themes, and then I'll wrap you up with a homework assignment to take with you when you're leaving the conference. All right. In the back. Nobody in the back wants to share. All right, next person who does want to share, reach out for the mic behind you. <laughs> Kara, one more turn, there you go. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> so our common theme in our table was just the establishment of an asthma clinic in a primary care setting, which was not an easy task. We really had to fight to get our asthma clinic. I had to fight like crazy for our asthma educator and really getting our primary care to focus on value-based outcomes instead of um, fee-for-service type, you know, we need to see more patients. So mm -hmm. it's been a, a, a battle, but a well-worth one in really helping our asthma patients. Sounds to me a little like a patient-centered medical home. That's exactly, How, right. that's exactly what it is, okay. How many of y'all are working on patient-centered medical home projects? Okay, I'm seeing some hands go up. This is good, this is good, all right. Up here, Emma, what about y'all? Do y'all want to present? Okay. Um, we have two RTs and a school nurse, and the common theme between the three of us was uh, providing evidence-based asthma education okay. to children with asthma, their parents or caregivers, and school staff. Um, in addition, just to reaching out beyond the walls of our hospital or school system and 
doing community-based, uh, whether it's primary care, having an RT available to provide asthma education and spirometry testing, and asthma camps as well, which would hopefully improve health outcomes and reduce hospitalizations. Fantastic. I think that actually may be the topic of the very last session for today about as evidence-based interventions. So hopefully we'll get some more discussion on that theme as we close out the conference. All right, maybe over to here. Um, so our topic was the low literacy in our clinics and how to take a long asthma action plan and make it more t tolerable for patients who have low literacy. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we cut the asthma action plan in half so that the green side, green means go, was the only thing they saw on the days they felt great. We made stickers for all of the um, daily controllers, and then I made um, moons and stars for puff in the morning, puff at night, and I write a two at the top, and so they get two puffs in the morning, two puffs at night, and that sticker goes next to their controller, and then we also write it out on the side for um, other people who help care for them, and every family member who takes care of that child gets one of those. And on the back, you have your yellow, for caution and your red for call and next to your albuterol paid choice is as needed only so that they know when they're getting sick we use albuterol as needed only not every day as our controller excellent so really making the asthma action plan motivating and accessible for kids all right we'll get these folks in the back and then karen and mary if you want to jump in with anything else we've done in florida to close it out we can, or we can skip right to the homework. All right, so we got this table here. Anybody want to share? And how about in the back? All right, folks appear to be engaging in a mini team building exercise. That's all right. We'll, we'll let that evolve organically. Okay, so Karen and Mary, do you want to share anything else about what we are doing here in Florida? All right. Then I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up with the homework to make sure you can get the full benefit of everybody else's presentations. So y'all did great with sharing today. I mean, impressive, especially at 8 o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much for being here. I'm really fired up about what we've been hearing in the room. I think these are exactly the kinds of interventions that we need to be moving towards to really affirm our population and to understand the diversity of needs that people may have that are not immediately apparent. So what I want you all to do today as you're driving or flying or speedboating home from the conference is think about how what you've heard today is going to transform your approach to asthma care quality improvement, what you're going to take back to your workplace and share with your colleagues, what you're going to do in your communities, and how you're going to think about what it means to provide truly effective asthma management. So what I want you to think about as you're heading home is I want you, didn't really use those slides, I want you to think about what's your model going to be going forwards and specifically how can you work as teams with your colleagues who have different training and different backgrounds to address some of the barriers that we learned about today, but also to reach for the stars with some of these amazing interventions that we've had folks share about. Y'all are doing incredible work in your communities. So think about how to bring that home if it's something that you're not doing yet. And keep thinking creatively about different data sources that you can use, different people you can engage, and how you can amplify their voices to improve the quality of asthma care that we provide. All right? And as always, if you want to reach out to me, please feel free. My email's up here. And you can also always find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, or ResearchGate. I'm pretty sure I'm the only Zan Novakovsky. <laughs> Just don't look for Richard Novakovsky, because that's my dad, and he won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but if you look for Zan Novakovsky, I guarantee you'll get me or somebody spamming me. <laughs> One way or another, it'll be an event. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your conference. <laughs> <laughs>